Arambide, and on behalf of the IWIMS Executive Committee, I'd like to welcome you to all to today's call at MS and COVID-19. For those, if there's any of you joining us for the first time, we started this call several weeks ago as a platform to share data on how COVID-19 could affect our patients and our practice. Those of you who are regulars will notice that this time we have fewer uh, speakers and for, fortunately this is the case because there, hasn't, there haven't been that many new patients included in the, some of the registers that we have been presenting. So just a reminder, some, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please remember that the call will be recorded and posted on the IWIS website in a couple of days time more or less. You can take a look at older calls there as well. The recordings now are also uploaded on YouTube and are now available as podcasts. And if you share the information presented here in your scientific circle or social media, please acknowledge the speakers and IWIMS. Now, all persons not presenting will be muted. Speakers will be, can unmute themselves when there's their time to speak. And also to the speakers, please remember to unshare your screen at the end of your talk. Questions can be posted at any time using the chat function and you will see the button with the word chat at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce the first speaker is Ruth, Ruth Dobson. She's a clinical senior lecturer in neurology at the Wolfson Institute of Preventive Medicine, if I'm correct, and she will present uh, data from the UK. So Ruth, please. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Um, this one, hang on. So let me just put this into, there we go. So hopefully, um, is that showing the, the slides only? Yes. Um, yeah. So what I thought I'd talk about is rather than talking about um, the increasing numbers in the registry, which as, um, Georgina said a relatively small or relatively modest increases in many of the registries over the past couple of weeks. Um, I'd talk about some slightly different work that we've been doing using some of the other data from, from our registry and something that's of really quite high topical interest at the moment, um, certainly within the UK. And this is vitamin D and um, the risk of COVID-19. So this potential link between vitamin D deficiency and susceptibility to COVID-19 is really gaining traction and certainly in the UK, And one of the reasons that this has gained tra um, traction is the question around whether it actually impacts on differential susceptibility by ethnicity, because I think as many people on this call will be aware, um, vitamin D levels are not always the same across different ethnicities. However, the current evidence is really quite limited, and a lot of it is extrapolated from either a the ARDS literature, so the acute respiratory distress syndrome literature, or observational data from those either admitted with COVID-19 um, or using population level data and then extrapolating that out. So what literature is there out there? I thought I'd just sort of have a couple of slides on this just so that people are aware of the background. So in ARDS, um, there appears to be a lower vitamin D level in those with ARDS compared to those at risk, so those undergoing esophagectomy. And it also appears to correlate to a certain degree with the outcomes. So those that do poorly after a, um, sort of within 28 days of ITU admission for ARDS have a lower vitamin D level at, at ITU admission. However, there's big problems with this data, um, as we'll come to. And part of the reason for that is that vitamin D is actually a negative inflammatory marker. There's also um, some evidence around vitamin D levels and susceptibility to respiratory tract infections. This is a patient level um, meta-analysis of all of the literature around vitamin D and respiratory tract infections. It was published a couple of years ago. Um, what these authors found is they found that um, in those that are taking vitamin D supplements, there is a lower rate of respiratory tract infections. However, subgroup analysis showed that um, daily or weekly vitamin D supplementation. So those with more stable levels um, were protective, but those regimens where people got large bolus doses every four or six months weren't. And interestingly, and we'll come on to, to why I put this in, but the protective effects of vitamin D were found to be strongest in those with profound vitamin D deficiency at baseline. So what about COVID-19? Um, so this paper is one of one of the few that are looking at it there's been some Lancet editorials around this but there's actually been very little data out there around COVID-19 
And this study shows that the mean vitamin D levels per country, so this is population level data, appear to correlate um, with COVID-19 mortality and COVID-19 susceptibility within country, although this is data really from very early in the, in the pandemic, and I suspect this will no longer be seen as huge swathes of Southern and Central America have been affected. So much of the evidence around vitamin D and COVID-19 remains relatively circumstantial. We know that serum vitamin D levels fall during the acute phase response. So disentangling cause and effect in a population that's either admitted to hospital or in those in whom you're trying to look for outcomes once people have been infected is really complex because actually disentangling the inflammatory milieu that, that goes with severe COVID from its impact on vitamin D versus vitamin D as a driver of disease is almost impossible. So we actually used a lot of the data that's been collected as part of the um, UK COVID reg um, MS and COVID registry. So at the moment, um, or in the last data draw, there were almost 5,000 people in the COVID-19 study, in whom we also had data on almost 2,000 people from a vitamin D study that we'd done over the past year. And there was 592 who had participated in both studies, and we had detailed vitamin D supplementation and exposure data on these patients. We had the um, daily dosage of vitamin D intake on 357 of them and 125 with um, lab measured serum levels of vitamin D. Of these 592, 34 um, have been diagnosed with COVID. Um, the mean age was similar between the gr groups and the fem female to male ratio was also similar. We got it's a predominantly white population, and this is seen um, within the MS register, although the COVID-19 study is now increasingly recruiting non-white non individuals. As you can see, um, those who developed COVID-19 appear to be slightly different in terms of their MS type from those with no COVID-19, um, and also a higher proportion are taking disease-modifying therapy, as you might expect with a higher proportion of patients with relapsing remitting disease. Among those participants who'd recorded their vitamin D dosage, the median was 2,000 units a day with an interquartile range of 1 to 4,000. And the prevalence of COVID-19 during the study period wasn't clinically or statistically significant between those participants who were taking and those who weren't. So first of all, we looked, are you taking or are you not taking vitamin D? And there was um, 5.9 were um, 5.9 of those taking vitamin D supplements developed COVID-19 and 6.4 of those not taking vitamin D developed COVID-19. And um, we had a relatively small number of participants in the COVID-19 group. What we did um, post hoc power and that showed that the sample size had about 80% power to detect a difference between the, the proportion who developed COVID and those who didn't. We also looked at vitamin D supplement dose in, in those whom it was available, and we found that there was no significant difference. So the median dose in those who did not develop COVID was 2,000. The median dose in those who did was 1,000. And actually, previously, when we've looked at the impact of vitamin D dose, the difference in vitamin D serum levels between supplementation of 1 and 2,000 2, units per day is not significant. And given the lack of power, because the relatively small numbers, um, we, we tried um, bootstrapping and we found that around 80% of the bootstrap data sets didn't show a difference at P of 0 0.05 in vit vitamin D supplement dosage. So probably this lack of effect of vitamin D supplementation dosage in the MS population is real. However, these population are taking, you know, um, those who take supplements are taking reasonably high doses in general and this is reflected in the levels there were very few patients who were severely deficient only one patient who developed COVID-19 was severely deficient and a number without COVID-19 but on the whole our patients had um, sort of normal relatively normal levels of vitamin D so what does this mean? So we showed that there's no clinically significant relationship between vitamin D supplementation status and dose and risk of COVID-19 in the MS population. Have we had really a lack of power to look at the, the serum levels or the severity of outcomes of those who develop COVID-19? It's again a further minority who go into hospital and then an even, a minority of that who require ITU admission and we did not have the power to look at that. However, in our study we had the vitamin D data that was obtained prior to the pandemic so what we really can do is say that this is actually a very stable status we're asking people what their supplementation dose was over the past three months so we have 
you know regular supplement dose so when what we're not get what we are getting is we're getting a reflection of actually what was happening at the peak time before um, all the discourse around vitamin D became so prominent because we've got a very small number of patients with, who are highly deficient in vitamin D, we would miss a signal from severe deficiency. And if you look at the um, literature around ARDS and respiratory tract infection, it may be that actually the signal for COVID-19 is there and we would not be picking that up. But what I would say is there's no large signal around sort of low to moderate dose supplementation and severity. So if people are taking any vitamin D supplement, um, then they're probably getting an impact. There's no indication around taking very high dose being increasingly protective. So that's the end of my slides. I will stop sharing, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Ruth. So are there any questions for Ruth? Okay. Is there, there aren't any at the moment. I have, have oh. uh, a question in terms of um, the uh, you know the, the levels of vitamin D. Uh, do you think that what has been seen in some of the infectious disease uh, in terms of protection was really uh, relating to supplements, or do you think it was the kind of baseline level of uh, individuals that mattered more, most uh, in terms of the risk, the increased risk of infection? Um, do you mean in the respiratory tract infections in yeah. general? Yeah. So, so, so in that population, what they really found is they found that if in, in the group who are profoundly deficient, so in those that are not taking any supplementation, that's where the signal was. Um, so in those who are taking some supplement, irregular supplement, getting a bit of sunshine, actually you lose the signal very quickly around vitamin D supplementation. So it's not to do with sort of low normal levels. There's no signal there. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure it quite does. Yeah, but, um, it's hard to dissociate the uh, sunlight exposure from... Sometimes. It's it's really it's really hard. I mean, so the respiratory tract was only looking at sup it, so it's only looking at supplementation studies. So they they didn't look at sunlight exposure. Um, I suspect part of the reason that they went for the supplementation studies is it's much easier to study, as we all know. You know, you're either taking a supplement or you're not. You can get data from RCTs with. There's more variables that drive that. Um, it's much harder. And I think, you know, even if they tried to do it, probably meta-analysis would be a very diff difficult way to do it. So they just looked at supplements and they looked at um, serum levels in supplementation. Okay. We have some questions now. Yeah. So, so what's the mechanism? Say, what's what's the mechanism so vitamin d is thought to be anti-inflammatory it's got um some anti-inflammatory effects so the mechanism around um covid is probably via its anti-inflammatory anti effects so via its effects on macrophages and on um the innate immune system i think is the theory i think that's far far from proven i mean we don't really understand well what the mechanism is of vitamin d and ms so um i think there's a lot of work to be done there and I mean, there's, there's a huge literature in, um, in the respiratory literature around vitamin D and around um, anti-inflammatory effects, but plowing through it, nobody really understands is the short answer. Um, yes. And then the next question, in the patients with longitudinal vitamin D, did it develop, change with the development of COVID-19? So we don't have that data at the moment. I, um, I suspect in those with COVID-19, it will change. I suspect also it will change in everyone. You know, we've now been certainly in the UK locked down for three months, although we've had the most glorious weather during our lockdown. So maybe it won't have changed as much as you might think it would have done. But um, we, there's, there's good data out there from sort of post-operative patients and things showing that actually when your CRP goes up, your vitamin D drops. There's a very clear inverse relationship between acute the acute inflammatory response and vitamin D levels that's over and above what you'd expect from just having no sunlight exposure and lack of supplementation. So probably in those who develop COVID-19, it does drop, but I suspect that's, that's effect rather than cause. Um, 
and then be interesting to look at the other registries and serum levels are relevant with a large number of patients. I agree. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's trying to get the levels before people come symptomatic and that's really the difficult, the difficult part because as soon as people are symptomatic or as soon as, as soon as this has become a thing, vitamin D and COVID has, has been a thing for, you know, a few weeks and it's increasingly becoming a thing in inverted commas and, and people change their behavior. So people go out, buy vitamin D supplements, start taking it, but actually um, they will, um, the levels will change more slowly than people start supplementing. So really you need to have people who are at a steady state. So it's actually now becoming increasingly difficult to disentangle. So you really have to have levels from a few months ago in a patient in a group of patients who are stably supplementing i would i would argue and then there's some comments i'm just going to read out these comments in case other people aren't reading so uh, margaret burnett said it would be interesting to look at the other registries sorry i read that one and then um a reader it enhances interferon signaling um and then there's a med review paper association of vitamin d deficiency in treatment with covid19 incidents okay so if there are not any questions now we can move on to the next spe next speaker and if you want to ask something about uh, roots uh, talk later on you can do it on the chat and we will go back to those questions later so the next speaker is Kate Fitzgerald. Um, I don't know if she's around here in the talk already. I'm here. Yeah. Okay, Kate, thanks. Uh, Kate is an assistant professor of neurology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And she's going to show some preliminary data from service of three different centers. So Kate, please. Okay. All right. You can see my slides, right? Okay. Yes, we can see them now. Okay. Hold on one second. My computer froze. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on behalf of um, uh, collaborators from uh, the SEMCAT and uh, Cleveland Clinic on a COVID-19 survey from a patient perspective, um, and this is an international collaboration. Um, uh, so the overall objectives of this study were to identify prognostic factors for infection or severity of COVID-19, um, as well as to accompany ongoing national and international registries. Um, it was also to evaluate pandemic-related changes to the MS care continuum, um, including changes to MS therapy, access to care and services, um, changes to insurance status or ability to pay for um, MS-associated costs, uh, particularly in the U.S., um, as well as to optimize future um, biological and clinical research studies. So facilitate linking with existing biorepositories and other large-scale studies. So for this study, it was a survey study collected at uh, or conducted at three MS centers. Um, it included online surveys or phone call screenings to identify participants. Um, these participants were from the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, um, and the SEMCAT uh, Institute in Barcelona, Spain. Um, the survey invited adults with MS who were followed at one of the above centers. Um, all of these centers are part of the MS PASS collaboration, uh, which is a learning health system in which um, system, systematic information on uh, uh, clinical as well as uh, patient reported outcomes are collected. Um, so importantly, uh, detailed information on pre-pandemic uh, characteristics of these, or of these individuals uh, is available. Uh, the baseline uh, online survey was conducted in April and May of 2020 and included assessment of COVID-19 uh, testing, symptoms, and results, as well as comorbidities, uh, social distancing practices, uh, employment characteristics during the pandemic. 
Um, and then uh, with the idea of creating follow-up surveys, which were conducted at least monthly thereafter, um, where we collect updated information on COVID-19 testing, symptoms and results, um, as well as access to MS care uh, or services, uh, including rehab or home care, uh, changes to MS management, uh, which occur during this period, um, as well as changes to patient reported outcome with a focus on depression, anxiety, um, and uh, social support. Um, so today I'm going to update and describe the included participants across the three centers and the overall design of the study um, and then provide some preliminary results uh, assessing um, uh, the potential COVID-19 cases, uh, predictors to adherence to social distancing guidelines um, uh, here in the U.S., as well as characteristics of changes to MS management. Um, so for this study, we included 300 or 3,073 responders uh, with a 21% respond rate, response rate. Um, our survey responders were on average around 50 years old. Um, they were predominantly female, white, and had relapsing remitting MS. Um, they had a disease duration of approximately 17 years. In our study, uh, the responders were more likely to be older, female, non-Hispanic, white individuals, and have a higher SES when compared to non-responders. Um, so this is uh, the characteristics of the uh, COVID-19, uh, or of the included study participants by COVID-19 testing status. So across the three settings, we, centers, we included 110 individuals, or we found that 110 of the 3,073 um, had been tested for, um, for COVID-19. Um, individuals with uh, taking other non-MS immunotherapies um, or have a history of a comorbidity, um, including diabetes, um, obesity, hypertension, COPD, the comorbidities are listed here, um, as well as those, as you might expect, those with uh, contact with positive cases or having a positive household contact were more likely to be tested. Um, these are just some preliminary results characterizing the 115 suspected or confirmed cases um, that we uh, ascertained across the three centers. Um, these were individuals with suspected um, but never tested, or so, so they were suspected by a healthcare provider of having um, of having COVID-19 but were never tested, or in, they were individuals that had a positive. Um, uh, COVID-19 test results. Um, so the most common, uh, and we also collected information um, in the US-based survey, how many times they leave the house per week or uh, not adherence uh, to social distancing recommendations to see if there were any differences. Um, of the uh, common comorbidities in this population, obesity and hypertension uh, were the most common. So around 30% of participants report being obese and then around 20% of individuals report um, uh, being hypertensive. Um, so importantly, um, we also in a subset of participants, so the participants based in the US where um, uh, restrictions on um, leaving your home are a little bit more relaxed relative to the Spanish population. Um, so we collected information on social distancing practices from Hopkins and Cleveland Clinic um, and included around 20 or included 2,270 participants. And um, I think this information is important because the results can help guide future studies assessing the impact of COVID-19 um, on MS itself for the pandemic. So for example, if individuals on higher disease modifying therapy are more likely to adhere um, to, um, uh, to social distancing recommendations and then have a lower risk of developing COVID, this could bias the results of assessing the effect of uh, therapy on, um, on uh, COVID-19 risk. Um, so these are here are some results assessing predictors of uh, uh, adherence to social distancing practices. And so what you can see here is that individuals who are older were, um, so the, what's plotted here are um, the odds for at least some in-person in socialization. So not adhering to the um, uh, social distancing recommendations. So older individuals were more likely to adhere to social distancing recommendations. Um, as you might expect, individuals who are um, required to work on site um, were more likely to not adhere 
um, as well as individuals with lower socioeconomic status. So the Area Deprivation Index is a composite measure of uh, social economic status incorporating 17 different uh, aspects and it's based on uh, uh, the zip code in which, uh, or the location in which an individual lives. Um, individuals with high school education or less were more likely to not adhere, as well as uh, individuals taking um, um, uh, oral disease modifying therapies or other um, disease modifying uh, therapies. So in addition, we also looked at uh, the pandemic associated changes to care and psychosocial outcomes. Um, and so this is included the populations from Johns Hopkins and Cleveland Clinic, so the 2,270 individuals. And um, of these populations, around 16% uh, had a disruption to rehabilitative therapy. Um, about 2% report an interruption to um, home care services, and then um, 100 individuals report um, having changed or adjusted their MS therapy uh, with delays being the most common type of medication change. And so on the right-hand side, uh, what we can see is we asked participants, um, this is results from the Johns Hopkins survey, um, uh, to rate how they're feeling their anxiety levels before or after the initiation of the pandemic. And as you can see um, that most individuals, so the blue line would be before the pandemic and then the red line is after the pandemic. So uh, for both anxiety and depression, uh, individuals report a shift to more anxious or more or report being more anxious or more depressed. So in conclusion, um, our study is an international research study based in the US and Spain of people with MS. Um, its goals to are evaluate risk and prognostic factors for COVID-19, um, and as well as to account for differences in social distancing behaviors. Um, it's also to identify and characterize changes to the MS care continuum and evaluate the downstream consequences of these changes, as well as to link to existing biorepositories and standardized data collection efforts. And uh, this work is um, supported by um, lots of other people, but the, most of the people uh, who've been working very closely um, are listed here. So I think that's everything. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, are there any questions for Kate? Not at the moment. So if, remember, if you have any questions for uh, while we continue, please just uh, start uh, adding them in the chat box. So I guess we can move on to the next speaker, who is Luis Rat uh, from the so an MS Clinical Nurse Consultant at Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, I think, if I'm correct. And she will update us on information in Australia. Luis, I think you're muted. Okay, um, good morning. Um, look, I'm Louise, the MS nurse consultant, as you said, from Melbourne, Australia. I work at Alfred Health, a, um, a tertiary institution that cares for over 800 patients with MS. And the Alfred was also one of the designated Melbourne COVID hospitals with the expectation that we could provide uh, or plan for 350 ICU beds. So I just wanted to um, be respectful to other people overseas because in Melbourne, we've had it incredibly easy in comparison to Europe and um, the USA. So we've had the luxury of time for planning and we've also had the access to sharing of your information. And being on an island far away and with the recent bushfires, which has reduced our tourism, we've had you know, very little COVID. So however, in March, we still started planning for our, um, uh, what we were going to do for our MS um, patients. And we changed all our clinics to telehealth. We had great administration and communication with our nursing. And then we really started to look at the infusions. And this is where um, we really wanted to provide and not have any delays in our infusion so that patients 
where you hoped wouldn't be worse off during COVID or worse off after COVID. And so the idea of the rapid infusion um, led by Annika Vanderwald and Helma Bridskoven and Olga Skabina and the rest of our MSNI team. And this is what we're hoping to do. And with the idea of rapid infusions, we were hoping that it would give us space because our infusion service certainly was looking like it was going to be accessed for an intensive care unit. And we hoped that it would also give time in case our nursing staff in the infusion centre were redeployed or sick. And certainly it would give less time for patients to have to come in to the infusion service. Uh, well. No. Well. So I think the, the first, um, when we we're looking at planning for the rapid infusions, we looked at the pivotal studies and other experiences, and we've all been very happy with ty uh, the safety of Tysabri, with lots of experience, with the AFFIRM study showing that there was only a 24% infusion-related reaction and headache and dizzy. Um, and we've known that, you know, the anaphylactic reaction has been incredibly low, specifically at the second dose. However, you know, everyone knows that the timing of those infusion reactions have got murky as the years have gone on, and patients certainly have wanted to discharge early from the observational time. And we also looked at this SACO study that looked at 11,000 patients, uh, 11,000 infusions in 302 patients. And, you know, they're infusion re reaction was only 8% and in post-infusion um, was only 2% and there were no grade 3s or 4s and all were mild. And what we, um, what SACO told us was that most of the infusion reactions in the post-observation occurred in the first four infusions. So what we wanted to do was um, reduce our natalizumab and we wanted to carefully select patients. So most patients had the first three infusions at the standard rate, but what we were hoping to do was reduce um, the natalizumab down to 30 minutes from an hour and reduce the observational time. So we were hoping to save um, over 30 minutes with this. And this was approved by our drug therapeutic committee as well. So since March, um, and with ethics approval, we've gone back over looking at the audit and we've had 190 infusions um, reviewed in 85 patients. And most patients now are coming up to two to three infusions. And we've only had 11 infusion related reactions in six patients. And there's been a wide range of ages from you know, 24 to 54 and from five doses to 130. We've only had, um, one related reaction, which was three infusion re reactions in one patient. She just happens to be a nurse who, with every infusion, and she wanted to keep going with the rapid, she had like this pre-syncope uh, effect, and she never had that on the standard. So she's a 45-year-old female at dose five, six, and seven, and she never had any hemodynamic uh, instability. It was just this pre-syncope feeling, so she'll go back to standard infusion. In the post-observational time for 30 minutes, we had no related reactions. And there was a couple of patients who, uh, one patient specifically who rang up in the post seven days, who had a headache for four days with both infusions. And she's had 109 infusions and never had them before. So uh, I guess that was related to the rapid infusions as well. So I think importantly, our data showed that there were no grade three or four infusion reactions and, um, and no one being discontinued. And so I think, uh, you know, the post-observational time with Ty Sabri is being challenged. And just once again, just the careful selection of patients that we put on natalizumab um, who had had three standard doses. So then we looked at Ocrevus and we looked at the pivotal trial for Ocrevus and looking at the 34% infusion rate with uh, OPERA 1 and OPERA 2 and most reactions occurring on that first dose of the 300 milligrams. But then we also, in making our decision, looked at these two small sub-studies that were presented at Ectrams last year 
and the CORD study enrolling 129 patients and most of them were able to have a reduced reduction in time from the infusion down from 3.5 hours to 2.5. And there was only 12.4% of infusion reactions and once again, all grade one and twos, no grade threes or discontinuations. And most people who got reactions could be treated by slowing down the infusion. Um, and the same with the sarcoid study, looking at different um, times for reduction in the time, whether it was dose two or three, there were no grade threes or four again. So we felt reassured with this information and experience to reduce our ocrevus. And I think this is where we got most of the saving of the time. So once patients had had their day zero and day 14, 300 milligrams, and if they were um, had no reactions, they at the first 600 dose, we reduced it down to two hours for all patients, hoping to save about 100 minutes for each patient coming into our service. So we've audited the ocrevus as well, and we've had 90 infusions in 90 patients. And really we're only at 13.3% um, you know, infusion reaction overall. Um, during the infusion, we had, the most we had was 12.2 um, and it was traditionally the itchy throat that was tr treated um, by uh, reducing the rate and giving some medication and that normally happened at the 200 mil to 300 mil rate so they've been going for half an hour to 45 minutes and they were able to go back up to rapid and complete the infusion we also had headache during this time as well. And once again, the rate was reduced at about the 300 mark for headaches. And post-infusion reaction was once again a headache. So for most patients, these infusions um, have gone incredibly well with a low infusion rate, no grade threes or fours, and no discontinuations of treatment. So I just think in um, COVID recovery, you know, want just to highlight the key selection criteria, three standard infusions of natalizumab before a rapid, two um, day zero and 14, 300 milligrams uh, with the ocrevus before we went to rapid. They appear safe and well tolerated. And it's certainly, even though we haven't had to use it, it's saved time during COVID and, you know, um, reduced resources. But more importantly, post COVID, we think reducing these times will allow MS patients to not have such an impact on their, their work and travel and family commitments. And it's also allowed us with natalizumab to look at the potential for hospital in the home with Tysabri, because we've been able to um, prove that shorter infusions are safe on our experience. And I just wanted to acknowledge um, Annika Vanderwald, Helmut Bitskuven and Olga Skabina for um, getting these rapid infusions off the ground and for the support. And also, we've also forgot to say that we've been doing a patient reported experience measure on the infusions as well. And all the patients so far have given incredibly uh, good feedback to the service and do not want to go back after COVID to standard infusion rates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Okay, now we start having a lot of questions. Um, I think we can go back to questions have been directed to Kate. And Kate has been answering some of them here in the, in the chat, but I think we can go through them uh, so that everybody can join that conversation. So there's one first question from Emmanuel, and is, uh, do you think at this point MS patients may have been more careful regarding social distancing than general population because of the fear that MS or MS disease modifying treatments may increase COVID risk or severity? Um, Kate. I think, oh, sure. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, definitely just my sense from the survey um, is that people are trying to be as careful as possible. Um, uh, but we don't really have any information on people without MS um, or without uh, who, or other, uh, like a comparable population. Um, 
But I do think it's important that um, the individuals with the lowest uh, socioeconomic status, they uh, were less likely to adhere. And I think this could be um, more reflective of not being able to follow these recommendations. Um, so perhaps they're essential workers or they have um, lesser ability to work from home. So I think those are important takeaways as well. Yes, then there's a question from Scott Newsom. Uh, first, he congratulates Kate for the job. And then he asks which therapies were discontinued in the 18 patients, specifically whether they were injectables versus orals or infusions. Um, so in these individuals, there was relatively, uh, uh, I just checked, um, uh, pretty equally distributed between the three therapy types. Um, I do know that um, individuals who are older or had more disability, um, they were more likely to have any type of change occurring. All right. Then there are comments uh, from Ruth Dobson and Margaret Burnett. Ruth says that certainly in the UK, there have been uh, very confusing messages coming from the UK government, which has only increased anxiety. Uh, I think we might have seen similar instances in other countries, but in the US, Kate, how would, do you think that might have influenced the results that you saw? Yes, I think probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then Margaret says, the, the vast majority of the patients I have spoken to tell me they're being careful to distance, but she doesn't have any hard numbers. So in that sense, I guess it's nice to have this study in which we see some numbers and see how this has been evolving according to the pandemic. Okay, and then um, the next two questions that we have, we have available are for Luis. Uh, one from Ethel Etel Kiampi. Uh, uh, she says uh, that they have had around 30% of post-infusion flu-like syndromes lasting for about one week after oculismal infusion. So she's asking if, do you have any similar observations? Um, not at the moment. And, and it's hard to know, you know, patients had to report in if they had symptoms and whether that was just that patients were not telling us those minor symptoms, but certainly most of the infusions patients could, um, yeah, we got no feedback like that. Okay. There's also this uh, recent publication of the Ensemble Plus uh, clinical trial with ocrelizumab with a short infusion as two hours. Yeah. Are you implementing that one there? Uh, we're not participating in that study, but um, w that was part of our planning that we looked at that study and that just added to the confidence that we could just reduce it and do it straight away. All right, thank you. And the other question is from Celia Oreja. She's asking, how long was the minimum duration of the rapid infusion of natalismo uh, included in the post-infusion period? Uh, so it was 30 minutes was the post-infusion um, uh, observation time. Patients could sign out if against medical advice, and some of them certainly were keen to leave the building, um, but 30 minutes was the required unless they wanted to um, sign out. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? May, may I do a comment about the, yes? So my, yeah, sure. my perception with, with my, because of one of the questions about the patients, the, of the MS patients, they have more social distance. So I have called a lot of patients with MS from our center. And uh, the SPMS patients, the secondary progressive MS patients, they were the whole time at home. They were not outside because I was thinking we were, we have a very low uh, death, uh, very low, the, our patients with SPMS, the most of them, they were not infected, yeah? And that's the reason I think was because all of them were at home. They were never outside, and the people, the other patients with their relapsing remitting MS, they, they were not working. Most of them, they were at home, and when they are outside, they go very, 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 perhaps only once a week uh, to buy something. So that I think I agree with Emmanuel that probably our patients, because they are very afraid, they are uh, keeping more social distance, and they are trying not to go outside, so that probably that is a... Uh, one reason why they are not so much of them, they are infected. So that is my experience. I have called many of them. I have no real numbers, 
but probably I can I can look up the numbers. But my impression is that the the most of them they were trying to stop to stay at home because they were very very afraid. Thank you, Celia. I think we have had a similar experience now that we're still doing mostly uh, virtual visits. I think when you call talk to the patient, especially those who are older or who have a progressive phase of the disease, they usually prefer to stay at home. And some of them are only venturing out just very recently and still a little bit afraid of doing so because that's what they, they basically tell you that and they ask about that. That's also, um, without seeing at the uh, heart numbers, that's more or less the impression I get whenever I, call, I talk to patients these days. I think we can close the session for now. And well, I want to thank you all for uh, attending this, this call and I hope you find it useful. And we hope to see you soon again, another time. Goodbye. <laughs>